Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar called Natural Climate Solutions Upside Down Rainforests. My name is Rosie Helson and I'm Marketing Manager at Natural Capital Partners. I'd like to welcome you all today and thank you for joining us to hear about how businesses can support natural climate solutions, in this case focusing on grasslands, to rapidly draw down carbon while delivering a range of ecosystem services. So this webinar is pretty popular. We've had a very good sign up rate from many companies around the world. Um, so that's clearly a topic people want to hear about, which is good news. Um, so first, just one slide on why are we doing this webinar about grasslands? Well, grasslands can be thought of as the reverse of rainforests with 90% of their biomass below ground in the roots, which can reach up to six feet in length. And a scientific study published in 2017 showed that 37% of the GHG mitigation required between now and 2030 to keep global warming to below two degrees can be provided by natural climate solutions. And we are actually running this webinar as part of a series. So today we've got grasslands and upcoming in the autumn or fall, as you say in the US, um, we'll have one on the forests, mangroves, um, and in the future, peatlands and wetlands as well. And grasslands are stable carbon stores as the climate itself becomes unstable. So even in wildfires, for example, the majority of the carbon will remain locked below ground. So that's a little bit about um, grasslands and why we're talking about them today. Um, so back to logistics, this webinar is scheduled to last one hour and we'll leave around 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. And you're all muted in listen only mode. So please use the panel on the right hand side of the screen to submit any questions and we'll go through them at the end. We have four speakers today. Firstly, we've got Nicole Rose Marino. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Nicole helped found the Southern Plains Land Trust in 1998 and has served as its executive director since 2011. Through her work, she is striving to create large short grass prairie wildlife refuges that emulate the American Serengeti that once occurred in the Great Plains. And following Nicole, we have Max Dubison. Hello, thanks for having me. Pleased to be here. And uh, Max is policy director at the Climate Action Reserve, where he leads the technical and policy development work related to all non-forestry project types. And Max joined the reserve in 20, 2008 and was the lead author of the Grassland, Proto uh, Grassland Project Protocol. Following Max, we'll have my colleague, Mark. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Um, Mark is Executive VP of Client Solutions here at Natural Capital Partners. Um, and based in Grand Rapids, Mark leads our work in the Americas and partners with clients like Microsoft, UPS, and Bain to drive positive business results through the management of their, their carbon and environmental impacts. And finally, we have Eric, um, who is the Sustainability Director of Workday. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Eric leads the company's global sustainability efforts and is responsible for the development and implementation of sustainability strategies across Workday's operations, products, and workplace, including 30 offices. And Workday supports grasslands and other natural climate solutions as part of its climate action program. So before we begin the main presentations, we'd just like to run a quick audience poll, which you should see on your screens now. So the question is, to what extent does your organization integrate natural climate solutions into your climate strategy? And as we just said, natural climate solutions includes activities that preserve and enhance nature's ability to sequester and store carbon. It's about improving the resilience of natural ecosystems like grasslands, but also forests, peatlands, uh, restoring and protecting degraded habitats and landscapes. Um, so give, we'll give a little second um, for you to respond to that question. Uh, 
Okay, so looking at the answers here, we've got a majority saying that supporting natural climate solutions is a part of our strategy, which is good news. Um, and of course, natural climate solutions and grasslands are not the only solution to our climate challenge, but they are extremely uh, potent carbon uh, sequestration tools and stores, and therefore worthy of further interest and investment, and they're particularly cost effective. So with that, I am pleased to hand over to Nicole, who will explain a bit more about the importance of protecting grasslands. Hi again, everyone. The mission of the Southern Plains Land Trust, or SPLIT, is to create and protect a network of shortgrass prairie preserves in the Southern Great Plains to ensure a future for its native wildlife and plants. We buy land and create prairie wildlife refuges. SPLIT has been making strides towards this vision of wild grasslands throughout our organization's 20-year history. And I'm pleased to share with you today how the carbon market has helped our land trust to greatly accelerate work to protect prairie landscapes in a region that has terrific potential for recreating the American Serengeti. Grassland ecosystems are by definition dominated by native grasses. In our region, blue grama and buffalo grass in particular. Both of these grasses have deep, thick roots that keep them resilient even under heavy grazing pressure. The diminutive buffalo grass, which only grows about four to six inches above ground, has roots stretching down seven or eight feet. Blue grama grows to about six to 12 inches tall, and its roots are up to six and a half feet deep. Both are perennials, so those root systems keep building up year after year. As Rosie mentioned, the title of this webinar connotes that grasslands are, in some ways, the inverse of rainforests. In rainforests, much of the biomass is above ground in thick vegetation and lush trees, locking up carbon. In the prairie, most of the biomass is below ground, sequestering carbon in thick, matted roots. As long as the land is spared from the plow, a fire can come through, drought can come through, the dust bowl can come through, a herd of hungry bison can come through, and these and other resilient prairie grasses will come back making this ecosystem an excellent bet for long-term stable carbon sequestration. To orient you, SPLIT's current land acquisition focus is in southeastern Colorado. We're different from many other land trusts in the U.S. in that we prefer to own and manage lands ourselves rather than simply hold conservation easements. This allows us to maximize benefits to native biodiversity. In his recent book, Half Earth, Pulitzer Prize winner E.O. Wilson estimates that we need to preserve 50% of a given habitat as a hedge against biodiversity loss. Researchers estimate that only one to 2% of the Great Plains has been protected in parks or conservation lands, so we'd better get busy. In some places, it's difficult to acquire land at a significant scale. Perhaps too much intact habitat has already been lost, human population pressures may be too immense, or costs are prohibitive. In the case of the Southern Plains, all of these factors are working in our favor. Most of the habitat remains intact. People have been leaving since the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, creating frontier era human population density, and land costs as little as $300 an acre. This strategic alignment has provided for a rapid rate of splits preserve expansion. We've grown to over 25,000 acres in our network with much of this increase occurring just in the past five years. Through the use of carbon financing, split intends to maintain this upward trajectory. The Southern Plains includes portions of Colorado, Kansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas within the United States. The Great Plains in general has long been thought of as flyover country, but there is in fact great potential for wildlife preservation here. I earlier referred to the American Serengeti. While an imperfect analogy, it's meant to convey that our region is important and worth preserving on the order of the African Serengeti. Just 150 years ago, there was dazzling 
animal abundance on the Great Plains, including immense herds of bison, pronghorn, and elk, thousands of grizzly bears, and over 1 million wolves. Despite the loss of most of these animals to market hunting and extermination campaigns, even today the shortgrass prairies of the southern Great Plains provide a terrific prospect for wildlands preservation. Split has identified a nearly 6 million acre area in southeastern Colorado that provides, in some senses, a step back in time. The sheer extent of sweeping intact grasslands includes dramatic scenery and outstanding wildlife potential. The gently rolling landscape challenges the notion of a flat and empty land. Its relief can hide a herd of pronghorn or an oasis of cottonwood trees. Where the swells lessen, you might encounter a lively, bustling prairie dog town. In our region, most of the animals have held on or can be reintroduced. Independent and government scientists describe southeastern Colorado as a biodiversity hotspot, and the main reasons why are its topographic diversity as well as its concentration of species found nowhere else on Earth. Most of the habitat was never plowed. This creates a great opportunity for engaging in the grassland sector of the carbon market, which places emphasis on lands that have not been plowed or have been in native grasses for at least 30 years. Getting down to the details of our portfolio, split generated carbon credits on our Raven's Nest Nature Preserve starting in 2015. Annually, this property sequesters about 1,900 metric tons. Note that this figure is the net carbon reduction value after Split's fossil fuel use is subtracted. Through this program, we're paying for our own carbon footprint before we're able to sell any carbon credits to others. Our Heartland Ranch Preserve is much bigger. It encompasses nearly 30 square miles and a higher proportion of its soils are suitable. It therefore generates 8,700 metric tons after Split's carbon footprint is subtracted. On Heartland, the presence of grazing animals, such as the bison we've reintroduced to the property, reduces the number of credits we can sell. It's not a large reduction, but I find the climate action reserve model embodies the precautionary principle, erring on the side of caution to protect the climate. And here are our numbers overall. With our existing projects, we're generating about 10,600 carbon credits to sell each year. The benefits to split from this new stream of revenue are an increased capacity to purchase more grassland, to sequester more carbon, and protect more habitat for prairie wildlife. What a wonderful feedback loop. If split did not have this new income stream, our ability to keep expanding would be most definitely less. Just as important, this is a recurring income stream that we can keep generating and utilizing for up to 50 years. Our carbon program therefore helps to smooth out lumpy financials typical of a nonprofit, allowing Split to better plan for future revenue rather than taking it year by year. And this is particularly important for our efforts to undertake large new land acquisitions. One of the problems in our region is economic stagnation, in part due to over-reliance on agriculture. Split's work to bring back native ecosystems is part of a restoration economy. We source our materials and labor locally. We attract visitors to a quiet part of the Great Plains, and those visitors patronize local service businesses. In these and other ways, Split's efforts are helping to diversify local economies, thus providing collateral benefits to local communities. Split's mandate is to protect native grasslands as well as the species within. The wildlife in the southern Great Plains are uniquely North American, and many are in urgent need of conservation action. To highlight just a few native animals that occur on Split's preserves, prairie dogs, pictured in the bottom center, must be allowed to play their enormously important ecological roles, which benefit hundreds of other species, including the burrowing owl, and swift fox, both depicted here. More wide traveled visitors, such as monarch butterflies, regularly occur on our properties. Pronghorn need adequate safe space to recover from historic hunting pressures and to avoid hunting even at present. Bison, the US national mammal, need extensive acreages. 
beavers and their dams need to be protected so that these animals can play their keystone roles in creating rich wetland and riparian habitat. Enrolling our Raven's Nest Nature Preserve and Heartland Ranch Nature Preserve in the Climate Action Reserve under the Grassland Protocol has provided Split with an increased ability to protect the climate by preserving native grasslands. The benefits to future generations of people and wildlife alike are immense. Thanks very much for your interest. Thank you for that wonderful overview, Nicole. I think that did a great job. Your presentation did a great job of setting the scene um, for the rest of the, the presentation today. Um, so we've had some questions come in already, um, which is great. And we'll go through all of these at the end. So please do keep com them coming in. For now, I will hand over to Max, who will describe the work of the Climate Action Reserve and the development of the Grassland Protocol. Excellent. Thank you, Rosie, and thank you, Nicole, for uh, setting the stage. Um, and thanks also to Natural Capital Partners for having us on this webinar. I think it's really excellent content. And um, I've been working on the topic of grassland conservation here at the reserve since about 2013, and it's really exciting to see the current momentum that we've got in this sector. So this morning, I'm gonna talk a bit about offset registries and what we do. Um, as well as the grassland protocol and where these credits, how they get generated. Next slide. So the Climate Action Reserve is a private 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're based in Los Angeles and we're founded by the state of California in 2001. We fulfill several roles, but our primary activities are the development of regulatory quality, standardized offset project protocols, and the operation of two offset project registries. One is serving the voluntary carbon market, through which we issue climate reserve tons or CRTs. So that's grassland projects are voluntary market projects. And then the other is as an approved offset project registry serving the state of California's cap and trade program. Uh, we currently focus on offset projects only in the US and Mexico, but we're working on our first voluntary protocol for Canada, which is coincidentally uh, gonna be an adaptation of our US grassland protocol. We've developed and adopted offset protocols across a range of different sectors and project activities from land-based projects such as grassland and forest, to agriculture, waste management, and industrial sources. In addition to our offset programs, we've also launched Climate Forward, which is a registry for ex-ante crediting of greenhouse gas reduction projects, as well as Climate Impact Score, which assesses greenhouse gas impacts of green bonds and other investments that are intended to fund climate-friendly projects. Next slide. So when we talk about carbon offsets, we're talking about an intangible good. So even though there's a physical project that exists somewhere in the world and records which can be reviewed, when it comes down to it, um, an offset buyer isn't purchasing something that they can pick up and hold in their hands to assess the quality. So for example, when you buy a car, maybe an electric car, uh, you could take it for a test drive, you can have a mechanic look under the hood, you can get a really good sense of what you're buying. But with an offset, you're gonna need to rely on information to assess its quality. So the five attributes that I've put on this slide should be met by any credible offset program. When identifying potential project activities for offset crediting and then developing the offset protocols, and then finally verifying and registering the projects against those protocols, it's imperative that we at the reserve maintain these minimum standards across the board. So I'll give you a little overview of each one. The first one is that it must be real. So each credit must represent an actual reduction in emissions, avoidance of emissions, or enhancement of sequestration. We need to avoid crediting for reductions that are simply due to bad accounting, invalid assumptions, or scientific errors. The accounting must be conservative, so erring on the side of caution, where scientific uncertainty can't be avoided. The credits must be additional. So the buyer of the offset credit needs to be confident that their investment made a change in the atmosphere. They need assurance that that ton of carbon would not have been reduced in the absence of the incentive provided by the carbon market. And this can certainly be one of the trickiest areas to define. Um, our program follows standardized approaches to additionality, employing multiple layers of eligibility screens, ensuring that activities are not mandated to occur anyway, and that those activities are above and beyond uh, business as usual. So each protocol is gonna define additionality uh, separately for that sector and then include specific tests and screens that are tailored to those project activities. Third, offsets need to be permanent. So when a carbon credit is used as an offset when you retire it to offset your emissions, this means you're allowing an emission to occur elsewhere. So when that ton of CO2 is released into the atmosphere, it remains there for an incredibly long time. So when we're defining permanence, uh, we can't really define permanence as being forever, 
uh, which would not be a workable policy solution. So there's been international consensus that permanence would be equivalent to the radiative forcing of a carbon dioxide molecule over 100 years. So for projects which reduce or avoid direct emissions like landfill gas destruction, the emission reduction is permanent at the moment it occurs. If you destroy that, methane's gone forever. For projects which rely on storage of carbon in some manner, either in soil or trees or otherwise, that storage must be maintained for 100 years in order for that carbon offset to be considered equivalent to the emission that it's being used against. Fourth, offsets need to be verifiable. This one's pretty straightforward. All offset credits need to undergo rigorous verification by an independent, appropriately trained third party prior to issuing that credit. And then lastly, no double counting. So offset programs need to have procedures in place to ensure that the emission reductions aren't double counted, including double registration. So the project can't be in two registries at the same time, double use or double claiming. We achieve this through um, several different steps. We avoid project types that have murky ownership issues. We provide explicit rules for different project types around when and how you can stack multiple incentives on the same activity or um, property, and then we operate a transparent registry system through which the projects and all the credits are tracked from beginning to end. Next slide. <clears throat> offset registries were initially created to build market confidence. You know, carbon offset markets existed without offset registries, and there are still ways to get offsets without going through a registry. Um, but I believe that the current voluntary and compliance market activity shows that registries have been successful in building market confidence. So in addition to the processes that we go through to ensure offset quality that I detailed on the last slide, there's other aspects of how we design the program and operate the registry that helps support market confidence. So we do all of our work in an open, transparent manner, engaging with expert stakeholders and the public, both formally and informally. The protocol development information is published on the web, the registry itself makes available information about all of our projects and all the credits we issue, including the verification reports, issuance reports, retirement reports, pretty much anything a buyer could want to know about their project. We oversee a rigorous third-party verification program. We also build tools and hold trainings to assist project developers and verifiers. And then finally, we put a lot of effort into communications to support both our users as well as the market as a whole. So I think it benefits everybody um, to have this level of openness and communication. Next slide. So let's get more specific about grasslands. Um, we first adopted the grassland project protocol in July of 2015. We're currently on version 2.0, having incorporated a lot of the lessons learned um, as the protocol has been implemented. It's a fairly narrow um, protocol in its scope. And that's allowed us to create a very streamlined and standardized approach to the quantification and monitoring. Grassland projects result in the permanent conservation of an existing grassland or rangeland, which has been identified as being threatened by conversion to cropland. So this does not include um, restoration activities, taking cropland and bringing it back into grassland. Um, it needs to be, the carbon is already in the soil. So we use standardized financial and land capability screens to determine eligibility, while also requiring that the land not already be protected prior to the project initiation. So we're essentially requiring new conservation easements. The crediting is based on the avoided loss of the soil carbon over time due to crop cultivation, as well as the direct emissions from those cultivation activities, such as fertilizer application or fossil fuel use. The on-site emissions in the project, such as from grazing livestock, have to be deducted from that total. The projects can be managed together in groups, what we call cooperatives, sort of a form of administrative aggregation, uh, for those of you familiar with that term. And this helps reduce some of the costs of developing each credit. We tried to build a lot of flexibility into this protocol, both at the project level, but also at the sort of management and the cooperative level so that it wasn't too restrictive and projects could be developed in a lot of different structures. The permanence of grassland credits is achieved through both the use of the conservation easement as well as continued monitoring for 100 years following the credit issuance. We also employ a shared buffer pool and other mechanisms to handle any reversals which might occur in the future. So far, we've got about um, 10 projects in the system right now, and we've issued more than 62,000 CRTs. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the specific projects later. 
Next slide. So this slide illustrates the basic life cycle for an offset project. Once we've adopted a protocol for a specific sector, the project developer can submit the project to the registry and initiate the activities on the ground. The reserve staff conduct an initial review of those submittal documents. And then once we accept the project and it gets listed in our registry, the project developer engages with an approved verification body. They are then reviewed for any conflict of interest and then can proceed with the verification activities. Our staff finally review the verification report and the findings at the end of the process. We often work back and forth with the project developer and the verifier to clear up any issues that might be identified before ultimately registering the project and issuing the CRTs to the account holder. Then project developer repeats this cycle based on the timing defined by each protocol. So in the grassland protocol, it's pretty flexible. Um, you could go through verification every year if that's what fits the um, finances of your project, but they can also defer for up to six years. And this allows flexibility in the way the project economics are managed. Uh, last slide, please. So the map here on the left um, shows our current group of grassland projects in the U.S. Nicole's projects are down in the southeastern Colorado there in the sort of center of the screen along with a project owned by Ducks Unlimited and one owned by the Nature Conservancy. Um, TNC is also working with the Climate Trust to develop a cooperative of three projects in Eastern Oregon. And then finally, we've got a private landowner up in Northern Montana who's been working with Blue Source to develop another large grassland project. We were fortunate enough to be awarded a USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service Conservation Innovation Grant in 2015, and that supported our efforts to conduct outreach and develop pilot projects. And that's where we began working with Nicole and Split on their projects. So that was a very successful collaboration with um, Environmental Defense Fund and CACO ISOM, the Climate Trust, SEAG, and SCS Global Services. Overall, we've been really heartened by the significant interest in the grassland projects. Um, and we're currently working with Varesco Solutions and the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association to adapt the protocol for voluntary use in Canada. So that protocol is expected to be adopted in October of this year. And that'll be the first time that we'll accept projects in Canada. So that's it for me. Um, if you have questions about the protocol or the program after the webinar, I'm always happy to chat, but thank you. Thank you very much, Max. That offers some really great insight into the need for a credible framework um, to underpin business supports of grasslands uh, via carbon finance. Um, so with that, I will now hand over to my colleague, Mark, who will delve a bit deeper into the carbon market and businesses approach to supporting grasslands. Great. Thanks, Rosie. And uh, thanks, uh, Max and Nicole. Nicole, every time I hear you describe the project, I get excited all over again. And, and I just have a single thought that I want to go see it. So hopefully someday we can work that out. But uh, I'm going to kind of drill down into some of the kind of the practical ap applications of this and, and how, how companies um, integrate uh, natural climate solutions into their corporate climate action plans. So uh, first slide. Great. So, um, you know, our experience has taught us that most companies with offset inclusive climate strategies, um, they they utilize a portfolio approach when it comes to project selection. And um, there are many factors that are considered when creating a port portfolio, uh, geographic proximity to company operations or uh, value chain, you know, a lot of supply chain work, um, alignment with corporate uh, CSR objectives. Increasingly, we're seeing the SDG, uh, um, SDGs as a kind of an organizing principle, and carbon projects are attractive um, for this because of the monitored and verified outcomes that they that they produce. And of course, um, alignment with budget. And uh, the great thing about portfolios is that they they enable uh, budgets to be managed with a with a high degree of of precision. Um, there are there are many types of offset projects from around the world. Um, household devices is a big a big cat category, so that's improved cook stoves, energy access, um, water quality is a is a rapidly growing category, and of course um, land use in forestry, um, also known as natural climate solutions. So our experience has also taught us that almost all portfolios include natural climate solutions. So why is, why is this? Um, next slide, please. 
So at a, at a very high level, um, humans have a unique connection with nature because, well, we are nature. We are quite literally part of the web of life. And I just challenge everybody on the call, just very quickly, think about your favorite, your most special, your most precious place in the world. More than likely, um, for the vast majority of you, that has some connection to nature. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm headed to Northern Michigan next, next week, so I've got a spot there that's been part of my life for a long time. Looking forward to that. Um, including projects that are part of natural climate solutions is a great way to engage stakeholders. These solutions are by far the most intuitive, they're most the most complex from a carbon accounting standpoint and Max's great overview of everything that goes into producing kind of an offset from one of these projects, but they're most intuitive. I mean, most of us learn by fourth grade that trees and plants store carbon. Any, any questions? You know, it's a very, when you, when you tell a stakeholder or someone that you're supporting, you know, a, a forest or a grasslands, it's, it's, it's very understandable. Um, when we support these projects, we can also be proud about protecting and preserving nature and as well as creating new opportunities for nature to thrive. Um, next slide, please. So, so how does this work from a, from a practical stand, standpoint? Well, what you have in front of you is a typical portfolio builder um, where you, you begin to kind of look at projects that um, perhaps are aligned with those CRG, C, uh, um, CSR objectives that have been evaluated against the SDGs that are kind of in the right geography and of course at the right price price point. But when it when it comes to natural climate solutions, what are the options? Well, the the the, the primary options, uh, particularly in North America, are improved forest management. So this these are these are often working for us that um, uh, improve, are managed to increase carbon uptake over time, okay? Um, and then there are reforestation projects, but that's a relatively small, as you'll see, on, uh, that, that's a relatively small slice of the pie. Um, there's just not enough um, reforestation as far as I'm concerned. And then, um, you know, from a carbon perspective, you have red, which is really kind of the big dog on the porch when it comes to, um, you know, carbon project categories. Um, if I could have the, the next slide, please. So if you, if you look at the slice of the pie here, that is not red. And by the way, this is carbon offset trans, trans, carbon offsets transacted in 2016. That's the most current year we have data for uh, at this level. Um, if you look at the slice of the pie that is is not red, one so everything up in the in the upper left left corner, one commonality is that all, all of these project types represent carbon that has been sequestered relatively recently. There is really no very little um, old growth uh, carbon, if you will. Um, I, I like to refer to this as as current carbon because it's been it's been sequestered and captured relatively recently in kind of geologic time. In contrast to the big a slice of red, if you want to uh, click, please, um, which is really I, I like to think of of of, of red as as ancient carbon. And um, and you know because you know these are these are ancient forests that have been in place and undisturbed, much like grasslands, for centuries, sometimes millennia. So a, a well-rounded portfolio um, includes both includes both types of 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 carbon, not only car projects that address current current carbon, but also ancient carbon in the form of red and and grasslands. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, in in the past, you know, our only options were red, and and these are incredibly important projects in places like Brazil, in Indonesia, um, Malawi, and 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 Madagascar. Um, and red will continue to be a critical part of the global climate solution. Um, but click, please. There's a there's a new sheriff in town. I had to I had to kind of give 
come up with one West Western analogy, um, and that and that is grasslands. And what what has all of us at Natural Capital Partners so excited about this opportunity is that we now have the opportunity to preserve ancient carbon in in the U.S. Uh, the narrative that can be built around grasslands is is compelling for for Americans and in in quite frankly many people around the world the U.S. West has almost mythical qualities conjuring up images of wide open spaces unbundled nature and adventure um, to be part of this opportunity not only not only to pre to preserve not only the ancient carbon stored in grasslands, but a slice of the American West is truly exciting. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That was a very helpful illustration of why and also how businesses can support grasslands as part of their carbon reduction program. And in terms of the why, it's certainly true that we all love nature. And I find especially people who work in corporate sustainability do for some reason. Um, so with that, I think that leads nicely into our final presentation um, by Eric, who will describe Workday's story. Well, thank you. And thank you, Mark. I think you, you really set the table well for diving into Workday's uh, climate commitments and our strategies uh, specifically to our, our offset portfolio. Uh, so next slide, please. So what are Workday's climate commitments? Well, uh, we have two major commitments that we made in 2016. One is one a commitment to 100% renewable electricity globally, and the other is to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2021. And the, the boundary around that net zero commitment uh, encompasses our offices, our data centers, and our business travel that those are sort of the major sources of emissions within our value chain. And we're, we're similar to many other companies that you may have, have heard of who have commitments to you know, carbon neutrality or, or net zero emissions. Uh, and what I'll do is uh, I'll, take, I'll take you through our strategy for achieving that. And then I'll talk you through a little bit where offsets fit into that strategy and why grasslands are so important. Next slide. So we've made significant progress. So we offer 2,600 customers with a carbon neutral cloud. Uh, this last fiscal year, we actually achieved for the first time 100% renewable electricity in every market that we operate globally. So this is our, for those of you familiar in the renewable space, our RE100 number for the first time is really 100%. And we've achieved net zero carbon emissions across all of our offices and our data centers globally. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with what Workday does, uh, we are an, an enterprise application provider of, for finance, HR, uh, planning, analytics, so we're, we're an enterprise provider. Most of our, our customers are large uh, corporates. And so what we really like about achieving these goals is that you know, we can be a significant portion of many of our customers' supply chains. And if you look at their scope three emissions, their downstream emissions, uh, we can help them achieve their climate commitments uh, by offering a carbon neutral cloud to them. So. In addition to you know this progress, well, how are we making that progress? Uh, so next slide. We we really focus on first reducing our emissions within our operations, and we've made some significant progress since our baseline uh, in in each of these particular areas. So carbon intensity per square foot is down over a third since uh, FY15. Uh, about a 30% reduction in, in carbon intensity uh, per total revenue for our company. Uh, about one third reduction in commute emissions per employee, uh, which we're incredibly uh, excited about, especially because we, we don't have as much control within that you know, uh, span of emissions. Um, and then about over one third of a reduction in data center intensity 
for the services that we're providing to our customers. So we're really excited about the operational initiatives that we've made to meet these particular uh, you know, reduction metrics. And next slide. And this is the strategy that we employ, look, should look fairly familiar to those on the call who are in corporate sustainability or uh, have helped organizations to manage their, their, their carbon, their climate commitments. So you, you, you sort of start from left to right, right? Uh, one is avoid, avoid those carbon intensive activities, then reduce more efficiently, uh, operate. Three is replace. Uh, for the most part, that's electricity, um, but can be certainly energy as well. Replace that high carbon energy source with low carbon. And then lastly is, is offset. And I think offset, that you know, step four doesn't get as much attention as it really should, because there are those emissions that we're just not gonna be able to offset. When we talk through the reductions that we've made as an organization, uh, you know, those are intensity reductions. We're still growing 20 to 30% year over year. We're a very high growth organization. So offsets absolutely have to play a role in us meeting our net zero carbon emission commitments. Absolutely. So we go next slide. So what does that strategy look like when we look at our carbon offset program? So we really want to maximize both the environmental and the social impact for all of our investments. And so we look for projects that meet the criteria below. This look, should look fairly familiar to you based on Max's previous slide. It's essentially uh, a, a lens to, to look at quality for each particular project. So similar to what Max explained, you know, additionality, uh, leakage prevention, permanence, verifiability. We layer in an, an additional uh, criteria, which is social impact. So similar to what Mark was sharing with respect to a portfolio approach, we, we, we take the same approach. We look at the sustainable development goals as a guiding framework for us to understand uh, the social impacts um, or the, the co-benefits for any particular project. So it doesn't always have to be on the social side. It could also be uh, you know, biodiversity, life on land. Uh, can certainly be on the environmental side as well. But what we do is we try to build a portfolio of projects that meet all of the criteria above to various degrees. Uh, and when we think about that portfolio, what we want to do is, if we take a step back, the challenge of climate change is so enormous, so immense, and so complex, we know that there isn't one single project type that will solve the challenge before us. So it's not going to be solely uh, you know, red uh, projects that meet uh, you know, the challenge of climate change. It's not going to be only clean cook stoves. So we recognize that we have to build a portfolio that helps reflect the variety of ways that we can address this challenge. And that's what we're looking at when we build Workday's portfolio of projects to meet our commitments. So we certainly do have clean cook stoves built in there. Uh, we, we certainly do have uh, red projects as well. Uh, but what we're also excited about is that uh, for the first time this past year, we have chosen to allocate, you know, carbon finance to uh, a grasslands project. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So we are investing in Split's uh, project in, in Southern Colorado. So we're really excited about this for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is, as Mark had alluded to, you know, you have this, you, you have a variety of projects that traditionally are in what you might call exotic places, what you might say are, you know, far away from many of our operations. We're a multinational uh, company. We have operations all over the globe. Uh, but 
often the projects that you're investing in are in remote areas that we, we frankly don't have you know employees living near there we don't have um, our value chain operations going through those particular areas so they can seem sort of removed from uh, from the day-to-day -day life of our employees and what I like about the opportunity that uh, grasslands particularly in the US uh, provide us with is we can now allocate our carbon finance to uh, to a project that is much closer to our operations that employees can really have a strong vision as to what we are investing in in this case conservation of grasslands and in our case we have a fairly large uh, office in Colorado in Boulder uh, which is only you know four or five hours away from this particular project uh, so we can build uh, communications programs internally to help our employees recognize the types of projects that not only are we investing in, but uh, that you know, they can connect with. Uh, as Mark had, had spoken to, you know, many of our employees, especially in that Boulder office, they live in Boulder because they have a deep connection to nature and they want to be closer to nature. They love hiking. They love getting outdoors. Um, and so this project provides a way for us to sort of connect with those employees specifically. So really excited uh, about uh, our, our investment in this particular project. I think it's high impact. Uh, it provides a great story and it provides us an opportunity to really invest a lot closer to home uh, and and make that connection hopefully inspire our employees uh, to go out themselves and and make personal choices that uh, that help address this enormous challenge that that is climate change thank you very much Eric so we've had our four presentations and it's almost time to begin the Q&A but first we'd just like to run our final audience poll so the question is to what extent are you inclined to support natural climate solutions like grasslands preservation? And that's thinking about in your business as part of your climate strategy. So the real question is, have we inspired you enough with our presentations today? Um, have we you know, helped you understand a little more about the importance and value? Um, and um, yes, so the, the answers are strongly inclined, somewhat inclined or not at all inclined. And uh, we've got quite a few people voting at the moment, um, which is good. So we're just going to show the results now. Wonderful. <laughs> That's a very high majority who are strongly inclined to support natural climate solutions such as grasslands in their climate action program. And um, of course, we'll be happy to answer any additional questions you have um, about that. And on the next slide, uh, we're going to show everybody's email addresses. Um, so if we aren't able to answer your question during the Q&A today, um, then you can feel free to get in touch with us and uh, we'll be happy to help. So um, we've had quite a few questions come in, so I'm going to choose a few of them for the panelists to answer in the time that we have. Um, I think, seeing as we just had Eric's presentation, it would be um, good to lead with a, a question that I think would be um, best directed at Eric. Um, how do you select your carbon projects each year? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're fortunate enough to work with, with Natural Capital Partners as a, as a trusted partner for us in building that portfolio of projects. Uh, so on, on an annual basis, we'll sit down uh, with uh, NCP and we will discuss our CSR objectives, our sustainability objectives, uh, our budget, our um, the impacts that we're looking to make. And we'll take a look at what we've invested in prior years and what we're looking to do for the current year. And we'll build that portfolio. We'll just sit down and, and map out those projects uh, and and see what we can see what we can come up with. And then w once we have that, th that's really my role as sustainability director within the organization. Um, and then we will 
more or less share that internally uh, with our leadership team uh, and, and ultimately um, allocate the finance accordingly. We, we use an internal price on carbon uh, to fund uh, and meet our climate commitments. So um, we're actually, in, in our case, the, the particular portions of our business that are generating these emissions are, are more or less charged back. The, uh, the amount that would be required to um, pay for the offsets that are needed to meet our net zero goal. Great, thanks for that, Eric. Um, one has come in for, um, I think it's best directed at Nicole. Um, what other benefits are there from grassland protection beyond carbon sequestration? Well, uh, you know, I think it's important to look at this issue globally. Uh, we just got a report from the UN, uh, many of you may have seen the headlines, that one million species are facing extinction. And I think that an approach such as ours to protect large swaths of grasslands, as well as approaches across the globe to respond to E.O. Wilson's call for protecting 50% of the earth uh, to preserve native biodiversity um, is, a, is a terrific way to achieve both ends, to confront the climate crisis as well as the extinction crisis. And I think there are some compelling examples in the Southern Great Plains of species that are literally on the brink of extinction. Uh, the black-footed ferret is one of the rarest mammals in North America, and it desperately needs large prairie dog populations in order to have a secure future. The lesser prairie chicken uh, should have been federally protected long ago. It has no federal protection at present, and it is um, hurtling into the abyss of extinction. And so that's how I look at, at this issue is by preserving intact grasslands, we protect the climate and we also take a meaningful step to addressing the extinction crisis. Mm -hmm. And how are you tracking and tracing the, the animals, including those endangered species that are roaming the project zone? Well, we regularly do wildlife surveys and plant surveys. And right now we're in the process of planning for black-footed ferret reintroduction. And the way to do that is to ascertain how many acres of prairie dogs uh, occur on the properties. Uh, and that's because 90% of the black-footed ferrets diet is prairie dogs and they cannot survive in the wild outside of prairie dog towns. Uh, and so that's the most, uh, I think, vivid example of, of how we're going to address endangered species preservation moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, for Mark, I know, again, you spoke about the um, how much people love nature. Um, a question for you, do carbon projects that allow or have connections with nature have more engagement opportunities than carbon projects that don't? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just um, they 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 provide um, different types of engagement ac activities. Um, I mean, certainly there's some kind of highly efficient projects. You know, landfill gas, for example, you know, gets the job done, of course, from a carbon and climate perspective. But there's not much <laughs> engagement. Uh, uh, you know, I think in some of the other categories, um, you know, household devices as well. There's there's some great kind of narratives that can be built around that. But again, you know, to my to my point in the webinar, these projects, because they are connected with nature and, you know, that humans are kind of alignment and, and participation in nature, they seem to to resonate um, you know, with um a larger group of stake stakeholders and people. So it's um yeah, I, I think it's just uh, it's not really either or they're just different opportunities and um um you know um very um specific to nature based solutions. Great, thanks Mark. Um we've had a question come in and I think uh you might be best to address this as well. Um how often in your experience how often do stakeholders or staff of our clients um, ask or challenge companies about the makeup of their offset portfolio? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, it, 
it depends. Uh, it depends on how you know some some companies um, you know want to tell the story, so they're out there kind of explaining the narrative of the projects they're they're supporting. Others you know are not you know choose are, are not really leveraging the you know the stories um, behind um, you know associated with the project. So I don't I don't think it's a um, you know it's a it's something that happens all the, all the time i think um you know one of the one of the interesting things is um you know we're seeing more and more alignment in the ngo community in fact many many leading ngos who are who have kind of are are, are preservation or or interested in climate uh, uh based solutions are are leveraging carbon finance to achieve their objectives so we're seeing much more alignment and support for um nature-based solutions um, within the NGO community and therefore um, fewer fewer challenges, fewer the traditional kind of challenges to offset inclusive stra strategies. Great, thanks Mark. And I wonder if um, Eric might want to answer that briefly as well. Um, if, you know, stakeholders or staff have asked about the makeup of the offset portfolio. Yeah. Uh, I on occasion, we do get questions specific to the portfolio. I think one way to engage that I found pretty helpful is, you know, in, in one specific scenario, we actually invited the project owner out to uh, to our, our company, and it was actually organized by Natural Capital Partners. Uh, and that project owner came out. This was um, uh, a, a, a water uh, filtration and, and cook stove project in Guatemala, he came out uh, and really helped make that connection to the particular project, what the project is doing, how it's a social enterprise, what impact it's making, why it's important that carbon finance um, from Workday be allocated to that particular project to make a difference. And I think that really helped our employees make that connection. That it, this is not an esoteric far off carbon offset project that um, you know doesn't involve people in the world and nature in the world uh, this is this is something that's high impact that they should be proud of um, that the organization is um, is funding but then also what I love about an opportunity like that is that it then provides it provides an opportunity for our employees to reflect inward and say okay well what can I do to make a difference myself? And it sort of leads, hopefully, to a, a ripple effect uh, in their lives in, in terms of making personal choices around um, either offsets or, or reduction of emissions, et cetera, in, in their personal lives. Great. Um, that sounds good. We've had a couple more questions come in for you, Eric. Um, I think you've pretty much answered them, to be honest, um, but you you might feel you want to add um, a couple more comments. Um, so one of them is, how do you get Workday staff and stakeholders engaged with your program? You sort of uh, mentioned a bit about that. And another is, um, do you offer employees to visit projects as a benefit or perk for those who care and, and want to experience Workday's climate efforts? Yeah, that's a great question. I, mean, I think I yeah shared a little bit about the former. I'll add to that. You can do you can do campaigns internally. For example, we're going to release our uh, our next sustainability report in the next few weeks, and so we'll build some internal campaigns, a carbon footprint challenge around that, where ostensibly it's about reducing your carbon footprint as an employee, but we can then engage with them and point to them about what we're doing as an organization through our offset projects. Um, and and then on the latter, absolutely, actually, one of the reasons that we are investing in this grasslands project is uh, I do have hope that within uh, the near future, we can organize uh, perhaps a trip for our employees, a handful of employees who are interested um, to come down from that Boulder office and visit um, this particular project. So. That's something that we haven't fleshed out, um, but in, in all honesty, that's definitely part of what we're hoping to achieve uh, eventually with this particular project. Wonderful, thanks, Eric. Um, I, we've got one minute left, and I think I that might allow us one question for Max. Um, are grassland carbon projects required to conduct direct soil sampling or land use change modeling? 
So with the way this protocol works, as I mentioned, it's very streamlined. And because we have such a narrow focus on that conversion to cropland cultivation, we were actually able to hire Colorado State um, during the protocol development to conduct modeling using the Descent model of the entire US. So we've broken the country into um, thousands of little strata and each project essentially needs to just identify which strata are contained within their project area and we have an emission factor um, for how much carbon uh, would be released per year uh, at a certain point in time over the project life and how much um, nitrous oxide would be emitted from fertilization, how much CO2 would be emitted from fossil fuel use. And that means that project development is much more straightforward. We've built an Excel-based quantification tool that has all of this built into it. So the project themselves do never have to break ground and collect soil samples. You can save thousands of dollars in terms of sampling, modeling, testing, all of that. Thank you, Max, and thank you for your previous presentation and on ensuring you know the permanence of the emissions reductions as well related to soil carbon storage um so with that we're at time we're to end the webinar i'd like to thank all of you once again for attending and asking questions and thank you to all our speakers for their presentations um if you have any further questions um their email addresses are on the screen and the webinar recording will be available on our website uh tomorrow and will be also sent out to everyone shortly. So please feel free to share that link with your colleagues. Thank you very much and goodbye.